Uh, so uh, Dr. Mike Snyder is the uh, chair of the Department of Genetics at Stanford and is a uh, well-regarded and uh, kind of global pioneer in genomics, uh, personalized medicine, in uh, some people don't know this, but also some of the very original yeast biology and yeast proteomics papers I remember back from the early 2000s, which was some of his first work that I read back actually as a graduate student back at Yale. So I've seen uh, Dr. Snyder's work uh, progress and expand over many, uh, at this point, I guess, I suppose, decades of work and is, be, is kind of the go-to person for most uh, questions of big data and analytics and multi-omics analysis for patients, uh, for organisms, for uh, also precision medicine, and also I think chair of the department, you also run a center there. I don't have your full bio in front of me. I'm just going it from memory. <laughs> You're doing but, great. All right, good, good. That's all from memory. And then um, and also uh, a colleague and collaborator and, and friend in many projects, including space flight and and uh, and and uh, large scale biology, maybe soon some virology uh, projects, which we'll probably hear about a little bit today. For sure. Okay, well, great. Um, really good to meet all of you. Feel free to interrupt with questions. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to follow the chat very closely. So if you see something, Chris, just uh, grab it and flag it up there and we'll take it from there. So anyway, it is a pleasure to meet with all of you and show you what we're up to. I am going to talk about um, basically using big data to transform healthcare. And let's see here, I'm trying to... So um, yeah, it'll, it'll mostly be about my research, I'm not sure if you want a broader topic than that, but I think it'll cover a lot of the areas that I, I think you were hoping we were gonna cover. It was not gonna cover space flight, so um, sorry about that, but um, Chris can tell you all about space. <laughs> okay, so um, we would argue that the healthcare system as currently implemented is, is broken. First of all, we tend to practice sick care rather than healthcare. And if you think about it, even the way we practice healthcare is pretty antiquated. Typically what you'll do is get in the car, always at an inconvenient time to travel to a physician's office. Uh, when you get to the office, you discover it really hasn't changed much in the last 40 years, maybe a few new gadgets, but for the most part, it's pretty similar. While you're there, they'll stick a needle in you and draw lots and lots of blood. And from all that blood, they actually, and the other time, you're, the other things they do while you're there, they actually don't make very many measurements, some of which are questionable. And then lastly, they'll treat you based on population averages. But we think all of these steps can be changed and improved. And particularly with regards to this last one about population averages, you've probably been told since you're little that your temperature when you put a thermometer in your mouth is 98.6. But if you actually look at the data that are out there, this is one typical study of 3,000 people, the number is more like 97.5. Uh, there's a recent study out of Stanford of 300,000 people. They came up 97.7, not 98.6. But the more important point here is there's a spread. This is 25th quartile. This is the 75th quartile. And so what that means in today's world, if your normal healthy baseline is, say, 94.6, and they measure you at 98.6, they'll tell you're normal. Everything's fine. You know, what are you doing here? Go home. But I guarantee if you're up four degrees over your baseline, you're not healthy. Something's off. And that's a big theme of our work. Measure uh, yourself fairly <laughs> frequently and, and see what your deviations from baseline is so you can catch disease early. <laughs> so your health, you probably know it's influenced by many things. It's influenced by your DNA, but that really only accounts for about 16% of your lifespan. Instead, all these other parameters we know intuitively impact your health, exercise, food, mental health, environmental exposures, and we're in a world now where we can quantify a lot of this, some pretty well, like activity, food is still a little clunky, mental health indirectly, but we do a lot with exposures ourselves. But even if you don't measure these directly, you can measure their effects by basically doing uh, data profiles on, you know, on the person itself. <clears throat> and so a number, and that, that's because of this revolution in technologies, I'm sure you've been taught this probably as part of this class, but Genome sequencing has obviously emerged over the last decade is quite strong. Uh, and these days with the new technology, it costs about $100 for reagents to sequence a genome. Uh, now the interpretation is still a lot more than that, but you can get, you guys can get your genome sequence with a minimal interpretation for $500 from companies like Myome and Nebula and things like that. Um, 
we would argue that, um, uh, uh, by the way, I'm not conflicted on that. I am conflicted on everything I'm going to tell you today. So um, just to give you a heads up that, um, yeah, you could distrust everything I tell you. Uh, but um, yeah, but I, I, I let you know when I'm conflicted. So anyway, um, mass spectrometry has been another revolution, probably a little bit quieter than genome sequencing, but you can now measure thousands of molecules out of people's blood and urine. Uh, and the wearable revolution we're going to talk about as well for, for profiling data. Uh, and in fact, when you think about from the genomic standpoint, it's not the genome sequencing it's limiting uh, region or factor anymore. It's really the phenotyping. And so we, we think these new other methods are going to be very, very powerful for, for phenotyping to go along with the genomics. So anyway, a number of years ago, we, we set up a, a project we call personal mix profiling. Uh, we actually set it up 14 years ago on me, but about, well, now it's a little over 11 years. Sorry, I grabbed the wrong slide here. Uh, on about 109 people. So we've been profiling this group for quite some time. And what we do is we actually sequence our genome. Once we draw blood, urine, and stool, and other microbiome samples, and we'll sequence our genome once, and then we'll we'll look at their DNA methylome, at least for a subset individual, soon for the whole group. We look at their transcriptome and proteome out of their peripheral blood monocyte cells, so their immune cells, out of their plasma, which is uh, the blood minus the cells. We'll look at proteome, cytokines, metabolites, and lipids. And then we've been studying, excuse me, four different microbiomes, so gut, nasal, tongue, and skin, urine samples we've collected. Um, and this actually turns out to be quite interesting to publish a paper. I won't have time to get into it, but they're very co-coordinated. Um, and um, this is on top of the clinical tasks, questionnaire, uh, some advanced tests like stress echocardiograms, glucose control measurements, and wearables. So one aspect of this is to take very, very deep data on people. And the other aspect is to do it over time. So we actually sample people while they're healthy every three months. And then if an adverse event comes along, like a viral infection, we'll take five to seven more samplings. So you might say, why are we doing all this? Well, we're trying to understand what a healthy profile looks like, not what a sick one is. How does it change over time? What happens at the earliest time of illness, uh, say here, you know, what's the difference between you and, and the person sitting next to you? You know, how similar and different are we? And then from the health uh, standpoint, can we use advanced technologies like genome sequencing, wearables, to better manage people's health? And I can tell you when we started the study, um, pretty much every physician said sequencing genomes of healthy people is a bad idea. You're going to turn everybody into hypochondriacs. They're going to it's going to cost the healthcare system millions of dollars. It's going to be a real mess. They've warmed up to it now because it has turned out to be quite useful. Although I wouldn't say everybody's quite warmed up to it. But anyway, with regards to this point, from the steep profiling, just in the first three and a half years, we had 49 major health discoveries, and they spanned a wide range of areas, heme oncology, cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, and so on and so forth. And, and no one technology, well, I should say, first of all, these are all found pre-symptomatically. Uh, and so some of them were a big deal. We caught some of the early lymphoma. These two are precancers that can convert to aggressive cancers. So they get monitored more. We had two people with serious heart issues, one picked up by genome sequencing, another by wearables. And that's another point. No one technology found these. Sometimes it was a gene sequencing, very relevant to, I believe, this class. Sometimes it was the imaging, usually combinations. This is picked up by both imaging and a number of markers, uh, and other times just straight up markers. So. So again, um, it wasn't one technology. And the way we like to think about this is if your health is a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, we're trying to get five or six, maybe even 700 pieces to get a much clearer picture versus what we would say is five or six pieces today. So much, much deeper profile and clearer picture of people's health. And so uh, one of the areas that was powerful since this has, a lot, I believe, a lot of genetics as part of it was a genome sequencing. So just from the first 70 people, there's more than this now, but we had 12 major health discoveries for Mendelian diseases. So I think you probably have learned about this. If, if you haven't, these are single gene mutations that put you at high risk. The prototypes are, are you know, classics like the BRCA mutations, which put women at very high ri risk for breast and ovarian cancer, but there are other 
you know, highly penetrant genes as well that these single gene mutations put people at risk. And three of them turned out to be a big deal, meaning uh, uh, they saved, we think may have saved people's lives. This, there's an individual with a mutation here, who, uh, it's, a, it's a heart gene, if you will, and, and mutations tend to put people at risk for dilated cardiomyopathy. This is a young guy. After he saw this, he actually did a stress echo follow-up, and sure enough, he, he actually does have a heart defect. He's on medication now, and his father actually died of a heart attack So uh, in his 60s, so we, we think this is most likely the culprit. <laughs> um, there was a, two individuals, that's what 2X means, who had mutation in this gene. One of them uh, did a whole body MRI follow-up and wound up having an early um, type of cancer, a thyroid cancer, and they had that removed. And so they were able to keep most of their thyroid and then, uh, you know, didn't need thyroid replacement therapy. So that was a big deal. And then lastly, nine individuals coming in the study were thought to be type 2 diabetic. Well, one turns out it wasn't type 2 at all. It's a MODI, which is a different form of diabetes. And and you actually treat it differently. So they've been on the suboptimal medication for many years. So the point out of all this is though, even though it's only 12 out of 70 a minority, but if you're one of these 12, it's a big deal. In some cases, we think potentially life-saving. So, um, so genomics was powerful. Now, these are these single gene mutations. I don't know if you've learned about this already, but most diseases are complex disease. And so they're not thought to be due to single gene mutations. They're thought to be due to common variants of, of low effect. And this is where polygenic risk scores kick in, as we'll get to in a minute. So single gene mutations are basically like getting clobbered with a sledgehammer. These, these complex diseases, again, they're thought to be common defects. And if you inherit the bad ones, you're at high risk. And if you get the good changes, you're at low risk. And so the, if you're you know, a high risk, it's kind of like these single variants uh, cause low effect, but lots of them uh, will kill you. And so death by a thousand cuts. So that's uh, how this is thought to work. And so the way people now handle complex disease, you may know, can't really see if you can raise your hand here, but this they, they do these polygenic risk scores where the idea is you, there are these association studies and people will sum over these association studies, usually over thousands, if not millions of variants to make predictions. And it, these all these are examples of complex disease. And it kind of works, but only really for the top two to 3% of people. If you look at what's called an odd score, it works for that group. It doesn't really work for most people because the effects are just too small. And so we think there's two reasons for this. One is, that the way they do this is by linear addition. And if anyone, if any of you have done genetics, you know that it's not linear. Um, one plus one is rarely two in genetics. If you have two mutations in the same pathway, one plus one is one, you don't get additive effects. And if you have two mutations in different pathways, sometimes one plus one can be you know, 15. They can be more than additive. So we think that's one problem. And the other problem is that they ignore rare variants. And so um, we came up even before AI was popular with some new uh, machine learning methods to try and get at the genetic basis of disease with the ultimate goal of trying to get better predictive models, better than polygenic risk scores. And so, or new forms, I should say. And so we started this, uh, we have two approaches. One of them I'm gonna tell you is applicable to this one, AAA, another is applicable to some other ALS and other things I'll tell you in a minute. Now, AAA is a very interesting disease. It, it's highly heritable, uh, and about 10% of people over 65 will die of this thing. Um, and the way you know at your risk is that your aorta bursts and you die. So it's a terrible way to be you know, have a risk score for a disease. Um, and so we thought it would be a good area to, to see if we could try some of these new models for an AI method for, for looking at, at complex disease. And um, basically what we did was something that probably would horrify GWAS people. We sequenced 268 cases, 133 controls. So not very many people, 401. And we sequenced reasonably deeply. And even though we did whole genome, we zoomed in on, um, uh, the rare variants in protein coding genes. So 
we basically went into the protein coding genes called pathogenic variants, things that are known to be pathogenic or likely to be like frame shift or what have you. And then what we did was we did a machine learning model with tenfold cross-validation. The idea, we even mixed in some EHR data because you can mix features. And basically what we did was we asked for genes that are rich for pathogenic mutations relative to uh, you know, the pop, the pop in cases relative to controls, I should say. And so there were three known genes for AA. They were kind of questionable at the time. And we wound up finding 60 genes that were enriched, again, with pathogenic mutations in cases relative to controls. And I won't have time to tell you ev everything about this, but we could show that, you know, these genes, they laid in, lay in pathways involved in blood circulation, which is what you would expect for AA involved in aneurysm, things like that. And we went on to show that um, the genes are actually um, misexpressed in A cases versus controls and the mouse models had A kinds of phenotypes and also were misexpressed uh, in, in mouse model models. So the bottom line is that we came up with these 60 genes and it, it actually, we were pretty confident that they're generally right. Uh, and then we could even go on and set up uh, a, pol a, a polygenic risk score that we think is is interesting based on a genome sequence. And so the genome as a whole has some predictive value, 0. 0.7, but genome plus HR is 0. 0.8. And this actually is a pretty big improvement in sensitivity, it turns out, over HR alone. Uh, and you can also use it earlier. This is most predictive as you get later. So the bottom line is from... We basically gotten at the genetic basis of disease much better uh, with this kind of new machine learning method. And we're now using this on quite a few diseases that works pretty well. The second method we use for, for doing this is actually using GWAS information. So this is the common variance. And so what we did here was we wanted to do GWAS information along with finding, uh, you'll see in a minute, regulatory reasons. GWAS hits usually land of regulatory information. And we applied this to two things I'll tell you about. ALS, which is known to be highly heritable, about 61%, and COVID severity, and I'll come to that in a minute. So ALS, as I mentioned, it's known to be highly heritable. Uh, there were seven, a big, big GWAS study was done, with, and seven genes were found from this. So it wasn't all that productive in that sense. Their, that group was very proud of it. But what we did was something a little different. First, we started, ALS is thought to hit your motor neurons. You may know people wind up pretty debilitated. Uh, and so what we did was first map out the regulatory regions of motor neurons with a method called a tax seek. And then we, uh, we also used chromatin marks as well, found over 100,000 regions in motor neurons. And then we said, well, let's see, are there any regions that are rich for GWAS signals using machine learning? Once again, I forgot to say machine learning is not linear, and that's one of its advantages. It can find these enrichments in a nonlinear fashion. And so there was a big GWAS study that had published for ALS that had just come out. And so we took the signal from this all across the genome and looked in these open regions. Is there enrichment of signal in cases versus control? We don't just grab the significant regions, we grab all the signal across the genome. And what we discovered is that in, uh, for, we went from seven genes to 690 genes and went from 6% of the heritability to 36%. And we basically validated this by a number of means. One is a, a second GWAS study. Uh, we did find many known ALS genes. Uh, three of the seven were found. Didn't pick up the other three. Maybe they're not as genetic. Maybe they have other effects. Um, we did show there are genes implicated in ALS by misexpression, what have you. Got enrichment for all those. And then we went on to show that the genes were actually downregulated. The 690 genes were downregulated overall in ALS versus normals, as well as in IPS-derived motor neurons. So we think, again, it's the right gene set. And then we went on to characterize this. We showed that those genes, they tend to be expressed. They're, they're rich for um, both expression and pathways in the distal regions of, of the uh, motor neurons. So meaning the distal regions are probably most likely ones responsible for ALS phenotypes. 
And then lastly, we took this even one step further. There were reasons to think one of the genes, one of our top genes may have Mendelian forms of this. So we basically went in and made, um, uh, recapitulated a mutation we thought was in one of the Mendelian cases. And so we did this in iPS cells and then derived motor neurons. And when we tested for ALS type phenotypes, we saw in fact, they did have ALS phenotypes. So we reduced neuronal survival. Uh, bad ab, uh, axon function. And this gene that's thought to be responsible for ALS, TDP43, turns out it's mislocalized in um, this mutation. So, so we actually think that not only um, are we finding genes important for ALS function, but some of these probably lie upstream of what's thought to be the known causative factor of this. Uh, and so that we thought was pretty powerful. <clears throat> So we then went on and we've now used this in several other approaches. Uh, here's one of them that we published. This is taking it one step further. We wanted to see if we could get at the genetic basis of severe COVID. So you probably know that when people over 65 get COVID, they can often wind up in the hospital or die. And that's because their immune system, it goes down when you hit your 60s. But um, anyway, for... Um, there, there are young folks who get severe COVID and they can wind up in the hospital or die as well. And that's thought to have a genetic component to it. So there was a very, very large GWAS study of 5,000 cases, 1.4 million controls, a big, big study where um, they looked for we, the GWAS signals in this and they came up with 40, I think it's 45 or 47 genes that were implicated in severe COVID. So what we did was the same idea. We wanted to see if we could find the cell types, uh, use, use the regulatory regions for relevant cell types for severe COVID. And we didn't know what cell types look at. So we took them all. So we took basically lung cells. There, there'd been a, something called a multium assay where you can get RNA-seq and ataxic data at single cell level. And we, we basically took the single cell open chromatin regions from all 19 cell types and looked for an enriched GWAS signal in each cell type. And that wound up working pretty well. We got 7, 000, almost 7,000 regions that were enriched in these severe COVID cases relative to controls. And um, across the various cells, some were common, some of the genes were in common, some were unique to one cell type. And then we went on for each cell type to say, how much of the heritability could we capture? And the, and the answer is most of the heritability is found in these natural killer and T cells, it turns out. Uh, and we could even, we did more open chromatin. It even turns out it was natural killer bright cells. Uh, that subclass turns out to be the one that's probably primarily responsible for the genetic basis of severe COVID. So the bottom line is we went uh, from 47 genes up to like 1,300 and some odd. Uh, and we went up that from that gene list, we can explain 77% of the most severe cases, which is like unheard of. And so again, I think this is the power of machine learning. It's a nonlinear method for finding these rich regions and cases relative to controls. We've now been using this on a lot of different um, disease types and it's actually working quite well this general method so so again uh ai is turning out to be quite val valuable for getting a genetic based disease so the other thing we've discovered is that as we're profiling people over time we can not only find you know conditions they might have we can also see how people age and it turns out that everybody ages differently so this person their top biochemical pathway is actually their cardiac hypertrophic signaling pathway. This person's a cardiac ager, and we later learned they have stage two hypertensive. Uh, this person actually has their coagulation, metabolic, and other pathways shift over time. They're a fairly typical ager. And so we actually call these aging patterns ageotypes. And as I say, everybody has a different ageotype. So each column's a different person, each row's a different ageotype. And so these four people over here, they're aging in all four categories. This person's not much of a, a, a kidney ager, but is aging in the other three. This person's a kidney ager, this is kidney metabolic and so on and so forth. And there are clinical markers associated with each age type. 
so people can actually take action and improve them. And, and that that's happened for some of the metabolic ones. I'll come back to that theme later. So again, we can tell people are aging. And more recently, we've just had a paper accepted where we can show that aging is nonlinear once again, where um, basically people over 65, a lot of pathways go way off. But there's also a very nonlinear time in the mid 40s when people will shift a lot in their in their patterns. And so we think, again, um, there are nonlinear forms of aging that are out there. So one question I get asked a lot is, how are you going to scale this? Um, you know, that's a research project, which is true. It costs millions of dollars, set that up, figure this out. Uh, and so I'm in Silicon Valley. So the way you tend to scale these things is using by forming a company. So we spun off a startup um, that's doing a medical version of this. Doesn't do everything, doesn't do RNA-seq because we don't know how to interpret that, but does a medically relevant version. Also does whole body MRI. Now, if you ask any patient today or any physician today, should you do a whole body MRI? 100% of the time, whoops, they'll tell you absolutely not. And do you know why? Oops, throw this out to the crowd. Why do you think physicians would say, don't do a whole body MRI? I'm trying to get to the chat. Yeah, anybody uh, want to take a guess? Why would a physician tell you, don't do whole body MRI? Well, because you'll always find some abnormality. Bingo, you got it, you nailed it. So, uh, and 100% of the time, they'll tell you, don't do it. And if you ask Mike Snyder, 100% of the time, I'll say, absolutely, you should do whole body MRI. And the issue is, do, do you not have nodules? W women have them in their ovaries, men in their prostate, 100% of the time, okay? So the issue isn't, do you have nodules? The issue is, do you have any growing nodules? And that's really where, basically, um, let's get back to this. Uh, here we go. Um, and so... We think that's the power of longitudinal profiling. And, and a good example is, you know, I have nine nodules. I've had 18 whole body MRIs the last seven and a half years, and none of them are growing, I'm happy to say. But I, I, I know that information. So if I ever get cancer, I'll be able to see, you know, uh, and they scan me for whole body MRI. I'll know they were there to be in the first place, and I'll know if any of them are growing or not. And I can tell you this happened personally, a very famous scientist, um, Got, got cancer and had it removed. It was discovered very late and he got it removed. It was fine. Then they did a whole body MRI afterwards. And he had three nodules on his spine and they didn't know if they were there to begin with or if it had metastasized. So he had them all treated and dealt with because he not, didn't have any baseline. So anyway, we think it's important to have this. So anyway, this company Q Bio, here's where I am conflicted just from the first 100 plus people of them doing whole body MRI and deep profiling, they found, you know, a case of early ovarian cancer, prostate, even found early pancreatic cancer, which is almost never found early. It's almost always discovered late. And um, uh, again, this is the power of doing this profile. It's picked up longitudinally. Most cases, it actually, there were several lines of evidence that would suggest this is off, that follow-ups and reveals what's happening. So we think a lot of these are potential life-saving. So uh, uh, again, the, I forgot to say, these are all found pre-symptomatically, just like the cases we described as well. So we think this is very, very powerful. Um, so um, yeah, I, uh, so that's the, the main part of the first part, but, and now, the other thing we've been working very, very hard, any, any questions about any of that so far? I should probably put this out to you. Darn, I don't know how to get to this chat. Keep, I know there's a way to keep it open, but I'm having trouble. Up oh, there, I got it now. Well, I'll let you know if something shows up on chat too, but I think it's good. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Yeah, I figured out how to get the chat open now while presenting, sorry about that. All right, so anyway, um, the other thing we've been working very, very hard on is this idea about home monitoring it. And we're using two approaches here. One is wearables and the other is microsampling at home where you prick some blood, mail it in, and then we do deep profiling off it. Uh, I know what that sounds like, but ours actually works as you'll see. So anyway, with the wearables, you may know they're very popular now. Uh, they, they're, they're about 20, 25% of people wear a smartwatch and they're powerful because they measure you basically 24 seven with some pretty important measurements like resting heart rate, heart rate variability, 
We can measure blood oxygen. They can measure skin temperature. Some of the devices are accurate, some not. They're all pretty good for heart rate, resting heart rate, heart rate variability. I myself use eight of these devices every day. If you looked up, I got my three smartwatches. One of them I'm broke. I normally have four. Got my ring. Even my hearing aids, by the way, I use them for hearing, but they actually do measurements as well. So we think they're very powerful, again, because they're following you 24-7 as long as you keep them charged. So um, the net result is that we, we started putting these on our cohort back when they first came out as fitness trackers. We sensed they're probably powerful health monitors. And so we put them on our cohort. And right away, we discovered, you can tell when somebody's getting infectious disease, in this case, from a simple smartwatch and pulse ox. And this is when I discovered my Lyme disease, of all things. Uh, I was in rural Massachusetts helping my brother put up fences and then two weeks was flying to Norway. And on my last flight, I noticed my blood oxygen dropped abnormally low using this what's called a pulse ox. And it never came back to normal when the flight landed. I also saw my heart rate was up and I later learned, I didn't notice at the time, my skin temperature was elevated as well. So the bottom line is that we could, uh, I could tell this all pre-symptomatically, uh, something was off from a smartwatch. I did get a fever off and on. I get, went to a physician in Norway who drew blood and saw my immune cells were up and uh, um, actually wanted to give me penicillin. I warned him it might be Lyme because of the timing. Uh, he gave in and gave me uh, doxycycline, which is what you take for Lyme. And it cleared it up right away. You take it two weeks when I got back, I tested as Lyme positive. It's a very well controlled experiment. I give an a uh, blood before I left as negative. So I see her converted during this time, even had some antigens tests. So again, the bottom line out of all this is I can first tell I was getting ill from a simple smartwatch and pulse ox. So um, that was nice. But, and then we went on to show, I had two years of data that um, every time I was ill, I had two viral infections and, a, and a, the Lyme and a fourth time when I was ill as evidenced by CRP high, that's a, mark of inflammation, it tells you when you're ill. Uh, I had this high, I was asymptomatic, but I but I did have high CRP every single time. We could tell I was ill by my resting heart rate jumping up in advance of symptoms. And so we wrote an algorithm to detect that, worked on me, worked on three other people, one of whom got sick twice. Uh, and, and that was all kind of fun and exciting. And we published this in 2017 and that was really great. And then along came COVID, as all of you know, in 2020 is when it hit us. And we're in a, a down phase right now. This is kind of an old slide. And if you think about how we tell when people are getting sick now, we usually use temperature, which is a 300-year-old concept. And it doesn't really work for COVID. If you think about it, half the people don't get a fever. So it's not really the best way to figure out if you're getting COVID. And, and these devices with the IR ones, they're, they're not so great because if it's cold outside, it reflects off your skin, it, you measure really cold anyway, and they just ignore it wavy in anyway. Uh, now it is true that antigens and PCR tests are pretty good and, and can measure, but they're not, you don't use them continuously and they're a little bit expensive. And again, that's not the kind of thing you're gonna do every day. So we think smartwatches could be very, very powerful for this. And so what we did was uh, when COVID hit, we quickly partnered with Fitbit got 5,300 people rolled. And the first step was to see, can we see if retrospectively, if we could tell if someone's getting COVID from a simple smartwatch. And what we did is we had 32 people who were wearing a Fitbit at the same time they had COVID and they had a diagnosis day and a, and a symptom day. And this is our very first case. This is resting heart rate. It's kind of a standard deviation plot. What we discovered is that, um, in this person, they were diagnosed here day 48. Their, their symptoms came on day 47, day before. And they actually had a jump up in resting heart rate. You can see nine and a half days prior to symptom onset. So very, very clear signal, easy to spot. And in the end, for 80% of the people, we could tell when they were getting COVID in advance or at the same time as symptoms. Uh, and the median was four days prior to symptom onset. COVID has a long pre-symptomatic period, so it's pretty easy to pick up. And then we went on to write a real-time detection system. It's an algorithm that follows people in a circadian fashion, looks for a jump up, mostly in resting heart rate, uh, too high for too long, 
and uh, you'll get red alerts, actually, the way we have it set up now. So you guys can sign up for the study, innovations.stanford.edu slash wearables. Forgot to ask how many of you are wearing a smartwatch, but uh, anyway, please do sign up with our study. We're trying to make this better and better. Half of and us. Just, oh, go ahead. No, half of us are wearing wearables, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Nice. All right. Great. You guys rock. Yeah. Okay. Please sign up for our study. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so um, this is one of our first cases. Again, this is a, this real-time detection. You get a red alert if your signal's up too high for too long. And here's, the, again, our, our first case. Here's when this person's symptoms first appeared. Here is when they were, they were diagnosed positive the next day. I didn't show it here. They were getting red alerts for three days prior to symptom onset. So uh, works for Apple, works for Fitbit. It's a cloud-based system. It's capable of following millions of people. We have, I don't know, over 10,000, but I'd like to get a lot. I want to get it to millions of people. I want to get it all around the globe. And then we showed that it actually works. Works 80% of the time. I know with more data, we can do better, more data types. And it works uh, on Apple, as I say, and Fitbit. It, it even works on asymptomatic cases. Here's a Fitbit asymptomatic case. So this person was diagnosed here but they're getting red alerts for two weeks prior to symptom onset. And it turns out it's even more sensitive than an antigen test. This happens to be my case when I got COVID, uh, but we have other cases like this where basically I woke up one morning, I did have some fa a family stress event and I'll come back to this in a minute. It's not specific for COVID. Uh, anyway, other events that triggered red alerts. And as getting ready to fly to New York City, you get mostly green days, by the way. And I wake up and I'm a little bit congested and I'm not sure, uh, you know, am I coming down with something? Is it allergies? It was in April. Yeah, it could be allergies. So I do an antigen test and I'm negative. I look at my smartwatch and I'm positive. So what I do, oh, I got on the plane anyway, flew to New York City. And before you can go to the meeting, I got tested again. It was bright positive the next day. So I spent a whole week in a tiny little hotel room in New York City all because they listen to my antigen test and not my smartwatch. So uh, it turns out it's very sensitive. It's almost two beats per minute. We can tell when you're getting ill from a smartwatch. Pretty, pretty sensitive measure. And then uh, we did show that it's, it's not just picking up COVID. I want to emphasize this. It's really a stressor alert, if you will. And if you've got non-COVID cases, basically workplace stress is the number one trigger of red alert. So that kind of makes sense that, you know, if you're, you're stressed, your heart rate is off and other features as well. Uh, I know if we pull more data, that's why I want you to join our study. We can tell the difference between workplace stress and, and uh, a respiratory viral infection, that's for sure. And I will say other things, most of this stuff you can contextualize. If you run a marathon, your heart rate will be up for several days and you can actually, um, um, you know, you realize that you just ignore it. Other infections trigger this as well, which we think is useful. And in fact, we're actually running some pretty cool studies now with transplant patients showing that this detection stuff really does work. And for uh, large meal, is that like Thanksgiving dinner or something or just any big meal? No, it'd be, it's a pretty rare one. I was surprised large meals triggered at all. Yeah, um, yeah that, that I think that was, yeah. I wonder if drink will do it too, you may know. Not, not if you have a one or two glasses for dinner, but if your tie went on, your heart rate will be up for... A bit, quite a bit, um, and so that'll trigger it. Yeah, great, great question. All right, so we think this is the tip of the iceberg. If you think about smartwatches, they really they're shining light into your blood, looking for spectroscopic shifts. They're measuring many, many things. And so once again, we did some machine learning to see if we could using features from a smartwatch to see if we can pick up clinical grade measurements. And we can get red blood cell count, hemoglobin, hemocrit level. Sorry about this. Um, uh, you know, uh, with reasonable sensitivity. It's not as good as a clinical test, but it's definitely good enough to see a shift from your baseline. And even hemoglobin A1C and fasting glucose measures diabetes you can pick up from a smartwatch. It'll measure your electrodermal activity uh, um, conductance, basically. So this is quite powerful. Um, the other area we've been pushing hard from the continue, from the um, wearable standpoint are these continuous glucose monitors that measure your glucose every five minutes. These are being used a lot for type 1 and type 2 diabetics, insulin-dependent type 2 diabetics. Our claim to fame was we started putting these on normal people and, and pre-diabetics. Uh, 
what we discovered is that a lot of normal people are normal. They have pretty good glucose control, but others are moderate spikers and some are severe spikers, just as bad as diabetics. And so using algorithms, we classify people in the gl glucotypes, low, medium, or high. And um, we went on to show that different people spike to different foods and Aaron Siegel had found the same thing. So some people spike to potatoes, others to bananas, some to pasta, so on and so forth. And um, yeah, how do you adjust your glucose data for the diet? Well, that's part of the point. Actually, different meals trigger this. And so to show you this, uh, here's some work from, um, uh, yeah, all right. Well, I thought I had this one slide. Anyway, this is some work from Aaron Siegel's lab. Here's a person uh, who spikes a banana, but not a cookie. Probably the only person on the planet doesn't spike to a cookie. Uh, <laughs> this person's a little more normal, spikes a cookie, but not a banana. And as they say, different people spike to different foods. And you can actually, this time, they call this time and range. It's a pretty important measure. And it correlates with your hemoglobin A1C levels, so your, your overall glucose levels. So it's and but it's a great way to see what's exactly spiking you. We'd found some people spike to bread and peanut butter, others are protein bars, which do have carbs in them, by the way. We found 80% of people spike to cornflakes and milk. This is really evil. Uh, I recommend you avoid it. Uh, it's probably worth some smoking, actually. So anyway, watch out for that. Uh, we showed went on my company here. I am conflicted as well. Uh, went on the show that just wearing a wearable and, and doing food logging uh, in a food logging app, you actually will improve this time and range. It's true for whether you're healthy or type 2 diabetic. They're very eye-opening. If any of you have ever worn a CGM, you'll never eat the same. In a good way, you'll avoid the foods that spike you and eat more of the foods you still like but don't spike you. Uh, watching this while eating your protein bar. I <laughs> love it. Yeah, watch out. There's carbs in that. You see those, you know, healthy kind bars, they're far from healthy. They'll send your glucose through the roof. Oh man, Matt, dump those cornflakes down. To, you, you gotta throw them out. I, I'm saving you. I'm saving you from a heart attack 20 years from now. So do, do not eat that stuff. It's super evil. All right. So anyway, um, the last thing I'm gonna tell you about is this fun story about home microsampling, which uh we spent about seven years on this, published it about a year ago. You can check it out. Uh, and the idea here is you do little drops of blood. They're defined volumes, either off fingertip, like this one, the Mitra, and then we have others with Tassel you do on your shoulder, Fedemex to the lab. And then we measure through omics profiling, lipidomics, metabolomics, proteomics, and, and targeted assays on important molecules. Well, we measured 2200 initially. Now we can measure a lot more with more advanced assays, but you get the idea. And then we went on to show that most proteins are stable, so are most metabolites. Lipids, some are, some aren't. We know which ones are and which ones aren't, so we can either ignore the unstable ones or correct for them. And then we went on, did some fun experiments. We had 32 people drink this shake. Many of you have heard of it. You can see it in CVS or Safeway or Stop and Shop. Um, and then we profiled them 0, 30 minutes, 60, 122, 40 after drinking the shake. And not a surprise, hundreds of molecules change after people drink this, but we can follow some pretty important molecules like insulin, C-peptide. This is an incretin, which is important for glucose control. And the cool result we found is shown here, everybody reacted differently to this shake. So each box is a different person. Here I'm just showing carbohydrates. And so this person, their carbohydrates plummet relative to other markers when they drink the shake. For this person, they go way up up, up, way up. Uh, this person's flat, this person's down, this person's down. And so again, very different reaction to the exact same shake. And we can, using clustering analysis, group people into five groups. Uh, this is the average of the group in gray, and these are classes of molecules. So brown is inflammatory markers. And what's cool is in this group of people, the inflammatory markers goes down after they drink the shake. It's anti-inflammatory for them. For this group of people, it goes up. Same with this group group of people. Same shake. For some, it's pro-inflammatory. For others, it's anti-inflammatory. And since basically 10% of people have inflammatory bowel, irritable bowel syndrome, and most don't know what it's due to, we're actually in a position to be able to measure it. It's pretty cool.
Uh, then we went on to do the ultimate experiment. We had one person take samples every hour for every waking hour for seven state, straight days, 98 samples in total, while wearing a CGM and a smartwatch and food logging, measuring activity, all that stuff. And over a thousand molecules change as evident by the microsampling. And then we could do some pretty cool correlations. We do time associated correlations as well so that we can see upstream events relative to downstream events. And the net result is we found thousands of correlations between heart rate, glucose, steps, probably not a big surprise, but some of it turns out to be pretty cool. And then we found a lot of new discoveries. So here's one, an obvious known one where your insulin C peptide goes up after C, after glucose, That's everyone knows that, but we can measure it. it's 10 minutes in this person. Here's a cool one that wasn't known, alpha-synuclein, which is involved in dementia and Parkinson's, has a very interesting pattern. We think it also correlates with stress, uh, and we're trying to pin this down, but imagine you're at risk for a dementia or Parkinson's, you may wanna know this so you can mitigate those stress events and therefore ideally push off getting uh, dementia or Parkinson's. That's the idea of something we're testing now. So we've gone on now to build dashboards for bringing all your wearable on McData, display it at a personal level. And this is Mike Snyder's world. I envision a world where people get their genome sequence before they're born, obviously too late for all of us, but you can still get your genome sequence. And then together with you know wearables and omics measurements, we can better track people and build personalized AI, AI tracking system for predicting risk, diagnosing disease, monitoring, treat disease. And then again, we do, and here's where I'm conflicted. We spin off companies around all this, spun off quite a few over the years. And I want to show you the power of this. This is the microsampling company with little pricks of blood. They actually, you, you give this, you know, drops of blood from your shoulder, you mail it in, and they'll give you back a metabolic profile of over 500 metabolites spanning 20 different wellness categories. And so they'll measure things like oxidative stress, marker bone health, uh, inflammation and so on and so forth. They can even measure your age. And what's kind of cool is from the aging report, you can see if your biological age is you know higher or lower than your chronological age. In this case, this person's is higher. And then you can follow from the age of types what's going on. So this person has pretty good inflammation markers, not bad for the metabolic age, but their heart age is a lot older. And the information's actionable. Once again, you can bring in AI to collect the information, feedback reports, so better people can better manage their health with the ultimate goal of keeping them healthy for as long as possible. All right, so to wrap up, uh, I'll just summarize this super quick, but deep data we think is very, very powerful for disease detection and for tracking your aging patterns. I told you about using AI for the start getting at the genetic basis of many diseases. Smart watches are powerful for the early detection of infectious disease, glucose monitoring for glucose dysregulation and personalized responses. And lastly, this microsampling, we think will be super powerful. We run pretty much all our studies now using microsampling versus conventional methods. It's cheaper, more convenient. And so this is a team as a whole, let's say I didn't talk about microbiome, but we have, you know, the wearables team was as peak was pretty big like this. Now it's you know probably five or six people, and the microsampling teams down here led by Shao Tao and Ryan. So that's the story. I think I saved time for some questions, and I'm happy to answer some if you have any. Uh, I see there's another question in here. Do you have data on HOMA IR from in insulin and fasting glucose? And the answer is yes. We we have a whole study where we're actually studying subphenotypes of diabetes, meaning. Um, some people are insulin resistant, some people have beta cell function and so on and so forth. We actually do a more fancier test on HOMA for most things. We do something called SSPG assays. So, so we are actually deep phenotyping because I didn't say I'm a type two diabetic, I'm a weird one. Uh, I actually make uh, insulin and I, I, uh, my cells respond fine. I just don't release it from the pancreas. So we're, we're, we're very keen on diabetes. So anyway, keep the questions coming. Forgot to pause and give you time for <laughs> collect your thoughts. Okay. Do you find that certain wearable devices are more sensitive than others? And do they have different baselines with similar 
standard deviations? Well, for resting heart rate and heart rate variability, they're all pretty good. They're within a, usually a few beats per minute of one another. So I, I think they're all pretty good for that, at least for resting heart rate. Now, at elevated heart rates, Apple's better, Fitbit and others, maybe not as good. Um, so they are different. Um, some of them have good skin temperature monitors, some either poor ones or not at all. It's one of the reasons uh, we built a company. We have a very good skin temperature one. Uh, so they are, they're all different. They're, they're different for different features that they're measuring. And um, the biggest thing that when people ask me which one to buy, it really depends on your personality. Because if you're good at keeping them charged, then Apple's a higher resolution device than say a Fitbit. But most people have a hard time keeping them charged. You don't want to be charging them overnight. That's a great time for health monitoring. So the best is, so if you're not, uh, for most people, a, a Garmin or a Fitbit, which have very long, you know, you charge them in 15 minutes, they last a long time. It works great. So for most people, that's best. So you don't, you're not missing much data. Do you want me to call? Do you want to call? I see Begum at his hand up next, if I'm pronouncing okay, your name right. Go ahead, Begum. Hi, can I go ahead? I'll go ahead. Hi, thank you, Dr. Snyder, for your great presentation. So my background, I'm an OBGYN with reproductive endocrinology, and my question is that your data is, of course, fascinating, and I would like to know how much you can incorporate the clinical data. For example, like we have patients with PCOS who are prone to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes risk in the future. Like when people are logging into your studies, how much demographic or clinical background are you, um, what you call your resources or you're able to collect? Oh, yeah. So we do, if we can get other data available, so for the IPOP cohort, we do bring in their records and stuff. Uh, and we try to build that into our various models. And we also try and use a lot of the omics to see what we can predict from the clinical side. Uh, so, so we do bring that in. And for the, you know, some of the it, we are incorporating when we can get it into the different models for like, um, we haven't used it so much for the infectious disease detection, to be honest, because I don't think it's given a strong signal just yet. Uh, but we'll see. We're still improving those models. Um, we we do try bringing in for predictions on insulin resistance to some extent for making predictions about responses to behavioral changes and things like that. So we do try to bring it in. I'd say we're doing more of the opposite, though, where we're trying to take the data we are collecting, predict clinical phenotypes in a much more um, sensitive and sophisticated way. So one good example is from a glucose curve, we can now predict just the features on a glucose conserve curve. We can predict insulin resistance, beta cell defects, five different sub phenotypes, some pretty well, some are not so great, but we're working on it. So we think that the data can be used to predict a lot of clinical measures and that's a big deal because that determines your, based on your subphenotype, determines clinical actionability, we think. So the way, you know, what you might do for an insulin resistant person can be different from what you do for someone with a beta cell. Depends on drugs you would take. Like I respond really well to rapinolide. I actually met form a non-responder. So um, yeah, so knowing what was wrong with me actually turned out to be valuable. Although these days I'm on... Trulicity, which is an Ozempic equivalent. Uh, boy, does that work well. I'm trying not to lose weight. Most people want to lose weight. I don't want to lose weight. But um, anyway, it does work well for dropping your hemoglobin. I mean, they wouldn't say that, I can tell you. <laughs> anyway. Well, thank, thank you so much. And I don't question on that because you were talking about Ozempic and other drugs. Too. So we see so many patients with PCOS and some of them are lean, some of them are obese. And, you know, sometimes we start with metformin uh, based on the guidelines, but they don't respond. Then we can switch them to GLP agonist, you know, category. And there is one now for z bond only for obesity. So I'm very curious that if you have like data or you incorporate the medication intake and you see the change in their response based on the medication. We're that's my last question. And thank you. Yeah. We've done some of that, absolutely. And so we are trying to track that. Um, 
Yeah, um, and we are trying to figure out, especially you may know for like GLP-1 inhibitors, the no number one side effect is nausea. And that's true for me. I get just a very slight grade of nausea. Uh, and I haven't quite exactly figured out what foods are triggering that yet. I'm working on that. And so we are trying to track that sort of thing because this would make it very quantitative. You can see what your inflammation is relative to this and then and then try to get people to, to tra track things better. Um, and also, um, you know, some people get pretty severe side effects from not, it's not common, but it does happen with Ozempic. And so they can't stay on it for so long. So if we have other ways of trying to get them uh, managed, that's a good thing too. Yeah, great, great questions and comments. All right, I see another one in the chat. Let's see about uh, GWAS and polygenic risk scores. Yeah, that's a good question. We're not, uh, yeah, there wasn't anything for AA, so we don't have a good, I don't have an answer to that. And also that one was based off rare variants, which is a different method. We're not quite there yet um, with polygenic risk scores for ALS and, um, uh, the severe COVID yet. We're working on that. It turned out to be harder, but we have good prognostic uh, predictions from the genome sequence for, for ALS, meaning who's going to get more severe and who's going to get more mild. That one's working pretty well. So we're still, I guess, trying to perfect and get our get models working for polygenic risk scores. So I don't have a good answer to that. It's a great question, Mar. And our machine pests, the, no, they're, they're still traditional, but how you use them, and you have to watch out for artifacts when you do this machine learning stuff. Um, there's an art to this. Uh, well, I'd like, maybe I should say a science to this, uh, that you want to make sure you're being A, get, uh, you know, um, replicative cohorts and various um, other things that, that will help you. So, um, yeah, so many, sorry. Um, Anyway, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, other questions people might have? Yeah, Nick has a question. Hi, right, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm curious, how do you think we can make Mike Snyder's world into the <laughs> real world uh, thinking and or in practice? Because, I mean, everything right now is based on industry, right? Like, there's no... I mean, maybe in another country, right? But I mean, in the U.S., like this is very not feasible, um, just because of cost and also because of practicality. Um, do you lobby for like being in? I mean, you you said that you did um, for being in healthcare, but how how can this practically work? Yeah, great, really great question, and and that's the toughest one. So uh, our healthcare system is broken in the way the whole financial structure works. It really is a sick care system. So to do anything I just told you, people have to pay out of pocket. So I'm a believer academics are good at discovery. We're good at proof of principle. We are, ourselves are no good at scaling. And that's why we're spinning off companies because they are good at that. Like my genome sequencing company, Personalis, they're just way, way better than my lab. Within a year, they were better than my lab. And I, I run the center here. <laughs> uh, and the, they'll smoke anyone. If you get cancer, you want to get them to sequence what they call loss of heterozygosity, all the stuff that other groups don't do. And they have really great, uh, you know, MHC profiling data. So uh, so companies are really, really, so I think that's the way to get out. But then the, how do you get it financed? And that's where we're, our system's broken. We don't have a system to keep people healthy. Uh, so what we're trying to do is show utility that if these things like smartwatches, they are valuable, then hopefully healthcare providers will bring them in. Now, smartwatches, things are cheap enough, and most smartwatches now have stress detector. And we'd like to take some credit for that. They won't call it illness because that has a medical implication, but they can tell you when you're off. If you get a Fitbit, it'll tell you stress. And that's really true. If you're just sitting around not doing anything special and you have red alerts going off, you're either physically or mentally stressed. And with more data, as I say, I know we can distinguish those two. So I think that will naturally find its way into smartwatches, but then that still only covers, you know, uh, 75, 80% uh, or misses 75, 80% of people, only 20%. But I, I think we need to say, I think there's only two ways to motivate people. One is money and the other is family. 
So if you would offer discounts to people if they wore a smartwatch, that would be a great way to get them to use. It. And I think they would actually catch the early and better manage themselves. You should get a discount to get your genome sequenced, if you ask me, and that would save you money in the long term. So we need we need creative ways. And, and these days, getting large employers, I don't know about Cornell, but Stanford has wellness programs for trying to keep people managed. Uh, and so I think that's another way. But finance, the other is family, like I say, uh, you know, like I remember when my mother-in-law got ill with ovarian cancer, was my wife kept calling her up and said, did you take your meds today? She was a, you know, a real bug to keep it going. So these are the sorts of creative ways we need in our system. And, and the other, and maybe what goes with the comment you just said, I know I'm rambling a bit here, but in the U.S., people only stay with their provider on average 18 months. So why would I dump a lot of money into you and 18 months later, you're gonna be with a different provider? And that is a problem. Whereas the single payer system that you alluded to, like Canada, other places, they've invested in you so, and they don't, you people don't move around. So the investment's a little better. So I think as these technologies get cheaper and cheaper, then it, who cares if you, if somebody leaves after 18 months, uh, in fact, then it'll be so cheap, you'd be crazy not to do it because people would not go to someone who doesn't have certain services. <laughs> so anyway, so I guess what I'm saying is we need to get them cheaper. We need to come up with financial incentives uh, because QBio costs $3,500 for that whole body MRI and their deep profile. That's out of reach for most people. Yeah. If they can show utility, maybe we can get it in the healthcare system. That's another biggie. Got to show utility. Thank so you. That's my long answer to your great question. <laughs> but you hit the nail on the head. It's the number one problem. Who pays? Do we have time for any more questions? Question. Oh, go ahead. So it's actually, uh, I'm going to try and phrase this as clearly as I can, but um, it's kind of a follow-up to next question, which is, uh, have you been thinking about ways to leverage monitoring that occurs during sick care um, that like takes advantage of the fact that for a given condition, you probably do have, you know, stable metrics that that don't change as a result of the condition and using, do you have any ideas about how to, how to use those measurements for other conditions? Yeah, well, I, I guess there's a couple answers to that. One is you do have to demonstrate utility with these new technologies. Uh, I think in a few areas, you can make financial models. And I think that's this is sort of an orthogonal way of answering your question. But like in cardiovascular disease, you can make a pretty strong case of getting people with family histories or any reason for suspecting to get their genome sequence or at least a cardiovascular panel. Because if somebody gets a heart attack or you know stroke or something, they wind up... Uh, you know, that's in a hospital, that's very expensive. At Stanford, it's $48,000 a day in the intensive care. And a genome sequence these days is 500 bucks. So you should be able to get this. Yeah, so, so in certain areas, you can make a pretty strong case for trying to get this incentive, get it into the healthcare system. Because if you save money, then providers and insurance companies in particular uh, will get behind it. Um, and for a population as a whole, you have to demonstrate that, gee, you do all this broad testing, it will save money. If it doesn't save money, most providers aren't going to want to pick it up. Uh, and uh, But if it, if it helps people, then people will pay out of pocket for it. So it, you got to get the incentives properly aligned, I guess. Uh, if anyone, I will. I'll ask one here um, just at the end, because I do have an Apple Watch, and I think one of the most fixating scores or metrics in there is the VO2 max as sort of a lifetime metric. One, could you maybe share, if you know, could you shed some light into how that's calculated? And two, suggest some other similar lifetime metrics that you think Apple or other providers could add based on the technology. Oh, great question. So VO2 max is, everyone will tell you, it's the best score for longevity, uh, for a lifespan. So having a good VO2 max, it really correlates well with, with lifespan. 
so I don't know because it's proprietary how they're calculating theirs. There's a simple VO2 max, which I believe is an 11 minute walk, if I remember right, for, and how far you go uh, <laughs> as a walk. So it's kind of a, 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 a brisk walk. And, and so that is a bit of a substitute. And so they're using a combination. They're, they're calculating energy expenditure, basically, because they're not doing oxygenic consumption like you would do. Uh, I think they're using combination of respiration, uh, energy expenditure, which you can calculate based on the rate and number of steps and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and yeah, expenditure over time, probably. So I, I think that's where they're getting it from. Uh, yeah, in, in a regular VO2 max, they're actually you, they're measuring your efficient efficiency of using your your blood your oxygen per se, and so they they have a proxy for it. If you're going to ask me how good it is, I'm not sure to be honest. Um, it probably has some value, but like a lot of these watches measurements are again heart rate heart rate variability quite good skin temperature quite good for some. I I don't know enough, but I do think the deltas are what counts. And I, I probably didn't, I want to emphasize that a lot. Like even if the blood oxygen measurement from a watch is poor, being able to see that shift is really what counts. And we should be thinking a lot more about deltas rather than absolute values in general, because our baselines are all different. So it's a great question you asked though. I would love to get a hold of their algorithms and see what they're doing. <laughs> Yeah, there's the Apple kit, but um, it's not as open as it used to be, but I think you can still get access to something. You can. It's not as high resolution data as, as you'd probably like. It's fine for most people, but if you're trying to build models for, um, yeah, the sort of thing, it, it's nice to get a higher resolution data. Most companies, that's been our number one problem, getting data and getting it in real time so that we can build these real-time detection models. Yeah.